next presentation. Shung Ping Chow. Shung Ping, you know, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency for 21 years as an on-scene coordinator managing environmental emergencies. Prior to working for the EPA, Ping worked as a geologist and mining engineer for extractive industries. Spent a year in research and development for an explosive manufacturer. In 2018 to 23, under an agreement with, between the EPA and the U.S. Department of State, Mercury and Critical Minerals Program, Ping led the design and implementation of the first mercury temporary storage system in Columbia, also the first of its kind in Latin America. Ping has a bachelor's degree in geological engineering, bachelor's degree in mining engineering, both from Colorado School of Mines, also a master's degree in public health from John Hopkins University. Registered professional engineer in the state of Colorado with extensive international experience in Cantonese, English, French, and Spanish, and is currently re learning German. So, I welcome. Thank you, Kyle. So I'm um, just trying to stay like um, clear some um, questions like what does mining has to do with energy development? Um, first of all, there's a, a lot of parallel in the, how extractive industry affect the communities. And secondly, with our transition, I mean, we tend to think uh, traditionally energy is carbon hyd uh, hydrocarbons or carbon coal. But with transition to renewable energy, say in solar, we need to mine a huge quantity of sand to get the silica for solar panels. And the transition from combustion engine to electric vehicles requires a, a variety of um, critical minerals in order for these vehicles. So in a, in a sense that a lot of the energy sources went from um, hydrocarbon intensive to mineral and mining intensive. And also one of the message I want to drive home is the not in our backyard uh, mentality doesn't work. And as we go through this, um, we'll keep coming back to that theme. So um, I'll start with the Minamata Convention on Mercury. So basically um, it's a international treaty, uh, UN with a whole bunch of country, you got 120 eight uh, signatories and countries in October 2013 that signed it. And they said, you know, mercury is a pollutant, it's very persistent. It has a lot of damages to environment and to human health, and we need to ban it. And one of the countries is Colombia, and they are the, one of the original signatories in 2013. And then their Congress ratified the Minamata Convention, the terms in 2019. Um, Artisanal and small scale gold mining is actually considered under the Minamata Convention an allowable use of mercury. That means mercury still can be imported and exported for use in this sector with certain restrictions. But Colombia went um, a little bit further and they actually banned it. So this is the kind of a breakdown is a little bit old, it's 2015 numbers uh, compiled by the United Nations Environmental Program about how um, anthropological generated mercury, i.e. that uh, mercury emission that is created by human activities, because like there are certain naturally re natural release such as like a volcanic, exp uh, uh, a volcano and um, other sources. And, and this, Picture is actually a little bit outdated because a lot of the industry, um, they have reduced like cement or uh, chlor alkaline, they have reduced the use of it. And so proportionally artisanal and small scale gold mining is the largest single source of human generated mercury emission uh, in the world right now. So in Colombia, in 2013, after signing the Minamata Convention, they created the law 15, uh, 1658. And as a side, this is the thing that drives me nuts working there because we, uh, the US law is similar to UK, we use common law and Colombia is more like Napoleonic Roman law. So everything has a number. So every time you ask somebody a question, they'll quote you a number and the law before they answer it. And anyway, this law of 1658, it banned the use of mercury, but it granted the miners until July 2018 to completely transition to mercury-free mercury -free technologies. 
But as a result, um, they continue to use mercury, uh, except that because it's illegal, and I guess everything that's illegal is more expensive. So the mercury price increased somewhere between 150 to 300 percent, and depends on like the location, who you buy it from, and whatnot. And as of last month, somebody from the Ministry of Environment told me that the wholesale price in mercury is approximately a little bit under 400 US dollars per kilogram. Then the little picture was like, um, there's a online marketplace called Mercado Libre in Colombia, not quite Amazon, but you can order things online. And even though it is banned, it's illegal, I could actually have mercury de delivered to my apartment in Bogota. Um, then those are the, the, the prices and the different quantities. So, but to be fair, um, it's not just color. I mean, yes, there's corruption and there are things that are inefficient in Colombia, but we cannot just blame it on them because it's actually a regional issue because um, they, they share a lot of borders and it's very porous. And for example, Peru still allow the use of mercury and Venezuela being that is almost like a failed state, they try to, um, there's a lot of mercury going into Colombia and gold going back and there's a lot of cross-border trafficking. So it's very difficult to, to control. And then the second thing is, it's kind of like a chicken and the egg issue because the, a lot of these small miners, they don't have mining permit. And they don't have mining permit because it's almost impossible. I talked to somebody in the Ministry of Mines and they said, hey, we need to help these miners get mining permits. And they said, oh, they need to fill out these paperwork. And I said, well, um, but they are somewhere out in Choco and in other departments. Um, again, digress, sorry. Uh, Colombia has 32 departments and loosely translated to kind of like our states, you know, we have 50 states. So some people were in that in further away from the capital, Bogota, I said, how are they supposed to fill out the forms? They couldn't even afford the bus fare from wherever they are to take the bus there. And they said, well, you know, they can do it online. But you can see some of the pictures that these people, do, some of them do not even have electricity or running water. And, and some of them are illiterate. I went to um, a meeting in Choco in one of the very specific uh, department in Colombia that is about 80 plus percent black population. They are descendant of slaves. And in one of the meetings, we had about 30 some people and we had passed around a sign up sheet. And there were two ladies that they put a thumbprint as a sign up because they cannot even write. So how do you, I mean, what kind of burden they're putting on them to become legal and formalize minor when they can't even do all of that stuff. And then when they are not, and when they're not a legal minor, then they can't even open a bank account because they go to the bank and they ask, you know, what is your profession? It's like minor. And where's your mining permit or your mining license? You can't show up with one. You cannot open a bank account. You cannot get a loan. So we want to help them to transition from using mercury to a different type of mining technology. But a lot of times it takes money to buy equipment, change the process. And then they don't have the money and they cannot change. They cannot abandon mercury. But if you're still using mercury, you cannot become legal. And it's just like a very uh, frustrating dilemma. So this is kind of like a global mercury assessment. So the so the biggest uh, the biggest problem is China, and the second is um, actually India has dropped. The second one currently is Indonesia, and the third is Colombia as far as global mercury uh, generation. But however, you know, when you look at China, you got about 1.4 billion population versus Colombia, you got a little bit over 50 million. So on a per capita basis, Colombia actually took number one in the world as far as mercury generation. So it goes back to like, why do we care? You know, I mean, it's thousands of miles away and they're doing this stuff. Um, based on a EPA study, approximately 70% of the mercury deposited in the United States come from global sources. 
So once mercury vapor become airborne, it gets into the atmosphere, it can remain floating around up there for approximately a year. And then it land wherever it is. I mean, there are studies like say, there's a mercury increase in a lake in Sweden because somebody is increasing mining in Indonesia and somehow they trace the isotope, trace the wind direction and everything. Um, so, and that goes back to what I'm saying, like not in our backyard thing doesn't work. Um, so it's very persistent, biocumulative. So a lot of times it gets into water with bacterial action and then it becomes methylmercury and it gets into the food chain and fish tissue and whatnot. So, and that's why um, some of you may heard about the mercury fish consumption advisory or tuna or uh, some of the fish that's higher in the food chain. In the early, 50, uh, in early 2000, at least 50% of the gold mine in Colombia is from informal or illegal sources. And they often use mercury and they often have um, some ties, sometimes with ties to cartel and armed groups. And at the same time, the US imported about 1.23 billion worth of gold from Colombia. So a couple of things, some of the ties, um, at least based on one source I was talking to, um, somebody in the Colombian military, they actually have an anti-illegal mining brigade. And they said that the cartels in Colombia and Peru are more focused in production of cocaine. Mexico has become kind of the marketing and distribution center for North America. So, but Mexico still has uh, active mercury mine. So a lot of times, I mean, they will fly cocaine to Mexico and instead of in exchange for dollars, they'll pick up mercury and then they'll take it back and they'll hand it to these miners to use this mercury to mine gold. And then they'll take a percentage of gold as a form of money laundering because there's nothing illegal about gold. You know, once you get gold and you say, okay, I make my money from, from, from gold. Um, and another thing about... I think with communication and with transportation, with travel, our Earth is becoming a lot figuratively, a lot smaller, and there's a lot of interconnection. And one of the things that I think is interesting is the supply and, and demand thing, because um, for a long time, we get illegal marijuana from Mexico, but now I'm from Colorado, so <laughs> it is... It is legal and by, by USA. So now we are using a lot of uh, marijuana from this country. Some of the Mexican cartels actually switched to avocado tree. And I don't know how you traffic avocado. Maybe they skipped the USDA inspection or whatnot. But we are using domestically produced marijuana. So, but with everybody wanting their avocado toast and there's suddenly this high demand of avocado. And I guess what I'm trying to say is like, um, our action has more than immediate consequences. So it is a little bit unfair to kind of blame the producer countries like, okay, you guys should not be generating cocaine and all that stuff. And we're spraying it, you guys would round up, but if nobody wants it, they're not gonna produce it. Um, so the next one is interesting. It's a graph from the Council of Hemispheric Affairs. It's a think tank in Washington, DC with people a lot smarter than I am. And they come up with this, that the relationship between gold price and coca production. So one thing that is, um, I mean, it's pretty obvious, but we don't think about it is like, drug cartels are not into drugs. They're into making money. So with gold prices being so high, they actually, uh, make more money from gold than from, from drugs. And you can see that when gold prices is high, they can drop the coca production. And when gold prices drop, they actually increase the coca production in order to make up of the difference. So, um, so I, I thought that was just interesting. And also like that all the interconnection of the little pieces is not just like, uh, you know, nothing is straightforward. So how, how on earth did I get involved? 
Um, U.S. embassies and consulates, every year they request science fe or fellows to assist on science, technology, environmental health, and various issues that the embassy staff, they do not have in-house expertise. And each year, EPA selects cer certain people. And over the course, there's more than 110 EPA staff around, uh, been around the world to help with the embassy on certain projects. EPA, in addition, also signed a bilateral agreement on mercury cooperation with the government of Colombia. So basically, they said, okay, we need somebody that knows mining, that um, knows a little bit of mercury. And I thought, well, you know, um, when I first got out of school, gold was like about $270 an ounce and oil was like $11 a barrel. And nobody wanted a geologist, a mining engineer. And one of the, my professors said, do you want to do an internship in Chile? So I went to Chile and did an internship. That was many years ago. And when I saw the advertisement for like science fellow in Colombia, and it's like, well, you know, I think I still remember how to speak Spanish. Um, I understand mining, I understand kind of health, and I've been with EPA for all this time. So I put my hand up and for some reason I got, got that. <laughs> So um, so some of the, the kind of like a snapshot, the background of the problem, um, an estimated 200, 250,000 Colombians engage in artisanal or small scale gold mining. And not all of the um, unlicensed miners are illegal. So there's a fine line between informal miners, illegal miners and criminal activities. I don't even want to get into the, the minutia. Unfortunately, on the average, approximately five grams of mercury, sometimes up to seven grams, is used for each, of gram, each gram of gold produced. And um, it depends on the mining method and the regions, because some of the miners, like for example, in Peruvian, um, Amazon, and I know I'm supposed to be talking about Colombia, but it's kind of regional. And when you look at the Amazon basins, there's not really like a clear cut border about what's going on. But they tend to add the go, they tend to concentrate the, the mineral first and add the go to it. And Colombians tend to do what we call whole ore amalgamation and they just dump it in without concentration first. So they use a little bit more mercury. Um, Again, it's just a guess between 250 to 350 tons of mercury are being released into the environment on an annual basis. And in some communities, that's in uh, Segovia, the concentration of mercury vapor in ambient reached 200,000 nanogram per meter cube. Um, the EPA clearance for residents say like you got a mercury spill we got clean and then how clean is clean the epa number is like 1000 nanograms per cubic meter is for residents and about 3000 is for offices and public places so that's like huge you know you go in basically your lumex or your jerome got packed and you have to drive out of town for 20 minutes before you could go and clear it and measure it again then you have social issues just like a lot of mining towns, except that is uh, further, um, like uh, child labor, child prostitution, drug trade, trafficking of endangered flora and fauna, because in order to go into the mine, sometimes they'll cut down trees and build a row. And on the way they say, oh, this parrot, I could sell it for a lot of money in the US or some collector's um, places. So they, they grab it. There are similar problems in Bolivia, Peru, and African countries such as Ghana and Mali, and um, also work with that a little bit. And basically, there are about 70 countries in the world still using mercury to mine gold. So that's an overflight of some of the Amazon areas. And at the end, you see more of a virgin forest. But basically, this is kind of like the, the sediment load is incredible chemicals and uh, erosion. So further up top, that's supposed to be what it's supposed to look like prior to uh, the mining damage. 
Um, I do have a correction. Our vice president said that 20% of the oxygen comes from the Amazon basin. That is not true. <laughs> and the exact percentage of oxygen is kind of up to debate because depends on like it, it's, and it's a system in itself because when the root is rotting, it actually generates CO2 or where they're burning or clear cutting. But um, it does have a huge impact on regulating climate um, and it's a huge uh, source of fresh water supply for the region. So, and then the next one is child labor. Um, a lot of things that we're doing is baby steps and super baby steps. I mean, obviously we don't want to see little kids mining in, in, in mines and especially with no PPE and working with mercury, but we can't eliminate that. So in order to help them, this is actually a project between US Department of Labor, they have personnel in the US embassy and um, there's a uh, NGO called Somo Tesoros to protect children. And we come up with these board games for kids. So kind of try to te teach them I'm sure 40 hours through snakes and ladders and some other game. I mean, it doesn't really work, but it's better than nothing. And then, so um, this is another thing that this is one actually, I work with the people in the, uh, the US embassy in Lima, Peru. Um, the um, US ambassador was visiting a region and then trying to hand out gifts to little kids like school supply, notebooks, coloring books and book packs. And in each other book pack, we laminate a copy of that. And so basically telling kids that, you know, when you have to burn mercury, don't burn it at home. Um, so what, what happened is a lot of times when they're using a, a plaster type of mining, they agglomerate the gold with mercury and then they torch the mercury. I mean, the, the torch, the amalgam, mercury becomes airborne and they're left with gold and they call it sponge gold. Um, there are people, they were at home next to the cooking stove and then their nose right next to it and they're burning it. I can't really tell them no, but we try to say, okay, don't burn it at home, burn it in the open so at least we can't eliminate the use, um, not with the resources we have, not with the challenges, but at least minimize it. So some, and it's just, it just really hurts to have to create these things for little kids. So that's the next one. Um, and one of the area, that's the one I talked about earlier is Choco, is mostly black. And there's a very, very uh, poor region. Colombia's minimum wage is approximately 330 US dollars a month. And these miners make, on a good week, they make about 40 US dollars. Um, it's also super, super biodiversity. And the rainfall is about, um, where is it? It has this huge rainfall. It's about two, almost 2,000 millimeters per year approximately three or four times wetter than the Amazon. And they have a lot of uh, African tradition still. So the picture on the left, those boats, that's in uh, Choco, Colombia. On the right was in Africa. I was in Africa late last year and they have a lot of, they still preserve a lot of the African traditions. And the next one, let's see. So, um, this one, I'm still, still trying to get to it. I wanted to talk to this community, but the US embassy decided that it's too dangerous for me to go to the field. So the organizer, I was actually working with a World Wildlife Fund. And so they brought the people to a place that the US embassy allowed me to go. And they were demonstrating that there's in the tr tradition, they have this loose leaves on the left. I'm still trying to get to what chemical reaction it is. And they use it in panning gold instead of mercury, then increases the, helps with the concentration of gold. But these ladies, basically they bend, uh, bend over in a creek, you know, getting sunburned, getting a, eaten alive by mosquitoes. And on a good week, they make about $40. Okay, so next one. Uh, so a little bit about, you know, how the U.S. Embassy overseas is organized. And 
mining, health, energy, everything is under economics. The I guess it has to be under something, you know, you can't just, they won't do a mining or energy stand alone. But um, depends, you know, when I first started, I was very, very fortunate. We got a great economic officer that was very supportive of the stuff because the people in charge of economics, they're usually like MBA types. They don't understand science and technology. But um, I was very grateful for him. So the area of focus, so basically, beginning in 2018, um, I did a three-month uh, assignment, but it split into two trips. I did six weeks there trying to collect and see what's going on and then come back. Um, it's also over Christmas, so it doesn't make sense when everybody is on vacation. And I did some more research and then I went back. Um, I was supposed to go back in January, but in 2019, remember the government shut down. So I was I was at home until the government reopened again I, in late February or March and then I went back. Um, I was basically embedded at the Colombian Ministry of Environment for th three months. I, they gave me my own cube and I'm working with them on a day-to-day -day basis. And, um, and then my focus ended up being the health and safety guidelines in handling mercury and storage and final disposal. What happened was like I was at a meeting with the um, Ministry of Defense and they said, oh, last year we con confiscated almost like six metric tons of mercury and we don't know what to do with it. Um, and, and, I, and I said, you know, this is maybe this is like one thing that I could get done in three months, just one tiny subject, um, health and safety and handling and storage. Was I naive? It took me five years to get it done. <laughs> it's not it's not a low hanging fruit at all. So so we work with the different ministry, especially with environment, uh, Ministry of Defense and then OES. Um, the oceans and environmental and science with uh, the part of uh, State Department and a lot of NGOs and um, as well as some UN folks. There are challenges because first of all, they, they presented a problem. We have this mercury, we don't know how, what to do with it. So I did a training on PPE and I brought some stuff there. And then um, a colleague in the Ministry and Environment and I worked together and we come up with basically just like a walk-in cooler from a restaurant, modified, fortified, and said, let's collect the mercury and store it there because keep the temperature low and keep the vapor pressure low. And initially we present it to the military because um, they said they confiscated all this mercury. And, as, and being that mercury is illegal, so it's also very, uh, very valuable, and we don't want to just put it anywhere because people are going to steal it. So we thought, okay, the military is a perfect uh, solution. They have the military compound and then they're secure. So we present it to them. And then at first they like it, you know, they like all the PPE. When I start bringing up chain of custody, suddenly they said, well, you know, we don't have a lot of mercury. Mostly the police have it. And I said, well, then how much mercury do you have? And they said, well, you know, you got a storage facility. What if there's a spill? And and went on and on and I found out that, and, and that was the probably one of the very few times I was scared in Colombia, because they don't want a chain of custody because they confiscate the mercury and they turn around and sell it to the miners, and and then I thought, uh oh, I'm getting in the way between people making money and these people got big guns. <laughs> <laughs> So then they went and went to talk to the police, talk to the attorney general and attorney general. I mean, they come up with all the more, most ridiculous things like, oh, we left the mercury in the field when we shut down the, uh, the mining operation. It's like, why do you leave the mercury in the field? Because it's, uh, it messes up the low balance of the, of the, of the helicopter. Okay. And I was like, wait a minute, you know? So anyway, um, I got lucky finally on another project I'm working with an NGO is to um, rework the tailings because a lot of tailings are old. And a mercury problem, actually, you can go back to the Spanish conquistadors when they first got there and they weren't using mercury back then. So as technology changes, there's actually still a lot of gold in the tailings because the, the methods is not, I mean, they're not high tech. And we said, well, what if we 
come up with a way to reduce the mercury and recover the gold and hopefully the gold, if not 100%, pay for the process, at least pay for part of the cleanup. And But then, then we start getting into mineral rights and land rights and who owns this tailing if it's abandoned. So we work with some lawyers and somehow led us to their, the Colombian Procuraduría, which is their equivalent of Inspector General. And at the same time, I mean, I really just, this is just a stroke of luck. There's an activist in this area, this department called Santander, was bugging the Colombian government and say, there's a lot of mercury in the drinking water is a hundred times over the World Health Organization limit. And uh, uh, Inspector General's office didn't know what to do with it because as you all know, cleaning up mercury in like a river in a nine point source is just a lot of work. So then they said, wait a minute, this stupid woman from the US is peddling her mercury storage system. So why don't we put one there? So the, I actually got played, but I'm happy to get played because <laughs> then they said, they went to the capital of the area, they went to Bucaramanga, which is a town that is where this active, near this activist is, it's like, and they told a laboratory of kind of like their DEQ's lab. It's like, you guys will have a mercury storage system or we're gonna sanction you. So, and then they told me that, well, they'll take your mercury storage system. And I said, oh, great. So I just put in and then I found out that, so they had a big to do, a big splash in news and say, uh, we are taking care of mercury problem and we're putting a mercury storage uh, in, in the lab. Oh, I mean, it's a good thing, but it has nothing to do with the mercury in the water. It's still not clean, but at no cost to them at all, they actually said that, oh, we're doing something. So that's how it come about. Um, this is like, I was having coffee with a di one of the directors of a national park. Uh, and next to my coffee was a jar of mercury. He's just storing it on his desk. So that's the fridge. Um, it's basically just a lab fridge, but the, I, I think the point is, it's not the structure, but it's a system. There's actually, we went through a chain of custody, you know, how to with the mercury. And we went through an emergency spill uh, response system. We actually um, uh, role play and say, okay, if I spill here, what is the thing not to, uh, what do we need to do not to spread it around and, and whatnot. So to me, the system is more important than the structure. And we have a contract with a, with a company in a town called Cali. And what they would do is like when the fridge is sort of full, we'll ship it over there and they'll mix it with uh, sulfur to turn it back into medicine bar or cinnabar. And then they add polymer to it to stabilize it and put it in hazardous uh, material landfill. So step forward. Um, so I retired last October because I still love to work because the government is driving me nuts. <laughs> so, uh, but there's some money left in the, in the, I mean, basically like I was funded by the state department, uh, state department and the state department gave the money to EPA. So there's some money left. And so EPA, I'm working, still working with some of my former colleagues because they requested like a, um, a training on site assessment, contaminated site assessment, and that's supposed to happen in May. And then uh, and then I got a call and they said the US Embassy wants to fund three more additional storage system. And one of the NGOs I worked with called me last month and say, hey, you know, you want to come down and work again? I said, yeah, sure. So, and all of that would not happen. Uh, from my former EPA, Laura Williams, EPA supervisor, she was super supportive. Jane and Andrew Chapman from US Department of State made it happen. Paul Cobb is a gentleman from Brookhaven National Lab, was super generous about sharing knowledge. Um, and then Colonel Carlos Alberto Montenegro, he, he has retired too. He was at one point a military attache at the Columbia Embassy in, in DC. And my utmost respect to the individuals in Colombia and working with the Ministry of Environment, the Inspector General's office, because yeah, there are times, I mean, I'm 
don't want to drama, be overly dramatic, but there are times that there are risks. And for me, you know, if things get too hot, I just catch a flight and get out of town. But these people I work with, they have their family there. Their whole life is there. And they know when they do these things that there's a chance of getting threats and getting uh, getting into a dangerous situation. And they don't get paid much. And they just kept working and working and supporting me. So um, I'm very, very grateful for that. And that's my contact. Now that I'm not with EPA, happy to take questions or talk about anything. All right. I think you mentioned that a couple of times that uh, you're working with some bad people that were trying to make money. Uh, talk about some of the security uh, there are some additional slides. So this is actually in Ghana, not in Colombia. Um, before going, uh, that's the thing. Before going, I had to take a one-week course in somewhere in Virginia. And I get to crash cars, um, get to drive very fast, do J-turns. Um, <laughs> so this part of the State Department training. But more realistically, actually, that's a very good question. And I think there's something that I want to share. And I made all my EPA colleagues carry a trauma kit after that training because um, tourniquets is back in fashion again. That, uh, that's my public health pain talking, not the EPA pain. Neurosurgeons are so good that they could save a limb after being in tourniquet for 23 hours. And during the training, we got some of the medics that were in Iraq and Afghanistan that safe people were training us. And so with all the crazy gunshot stuff going on and working in remote areas, I went back to my boss and say, we all need a, a, a trunk. I mean, it's a small kit. This may be $100, but it's something to look into keep carrying around or keeping in your car, especially in remote areas that may save your life. This is the bedroom door uh, of the apartment that I stayed provided by the State Department is basically like a jail door. When you under that wood is like a metal grid, and then it has a metal frame. On the left is the boat on the hinge side. There were four of those, and then there's one up top, and then on the other side, there were all of those. So they said, like, if, if things get really scary, then go there and lock and barricade yourself and call the Marines. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I never got into that situation. One of the greatest challenges working with the different cultures uh, within Colombia. Is there any special uh, circumstances that, that present a problem of working with someone from a completely different culture? From I don't think so. Um, I think I have the benefit that I'm not a natural born US citizen. I grew up in Hong Kong. I moved in this country when I was 15. So there are a lot of times I was able to look at things from a foreigner's perspective. Because you can't just go there and pound your chest and say, we're the US government, we're the 400 pound gorilla and we want this to happen. You have to convince them. And and it, and it, I don't even have to lie because Colombia is a beautiful country, huge biodiversity. Um, I think over 30% of the birds found on earth either live in Colombia or migrate through Colombia. So that it's like, you can just convince them, hey, you know, you got all of these resources and let's not mess it up. And um, let, let's protect the environment and protect your, your children's health. So that's not, I don't think it's that difficult. If you, going back to somebody said that, you know, just a common sense, try to put yourself in their shoes. You know, you don't want somebody to come in and tell you what to do. Thanks, Jane. Um, Thank can you tell me in that one slide where you showed the Amazon so disturbed? Is there anything being done um, in those areas to clean that up? There is really no cleanup. It's kind of like a whack a mole because you got Colombia, you got Peru, you got Brazil, you got Ecuador and Bolivia all sharing the Amazon. And so the river, the ecosystem, there's a no country borders. And another thing is, is a little bit disturbing, but we're trying to give them some oil spill training in the upcoming in May from my colleagues, because when they, so 
the picture I saw are the really artisanal mining with women basically just panning like we do in the West. But there are some more organized stuff. And um, for example, in the area I show in Choco, there are a lot of Brazilian dredges and they have these big dredges dredging the river for gold. And when the Colombian army showed up, they basically bomb it and burn it that create different kind of uh, pollution. So I asked them, like, why don't you like the U.S. government? Like, you know, when IRS or the government confiscates stuff, we have an auction and we sell it. And so we don't waste resources. I mean, it, these dredges are not exactly cheap and the government could generate some income. And is that because of the criminal element, for example, if you go to an auction and buy this dredger or they confiscate a, a house and then you buy the house from the government, you move in. The organizations, be it paramilitary or crime, they'll come back to you and threaten you and say, hey, this used to be an apartment. You better move out. I'm going to get it back. So to avoid that, they just burn everything. And I don't think we have got to the point that we can consider cleaning it up because they're still generating mercury. So like instead of cleaning it up, I think the focus is to uh, prevent further contamination.